Hello, my name is Eduardo Rosas and I want to teach you how to build Android and iOS apps using Xamarin. So welcome to this Xamarin Forms course. Before anything, I want to tell you a story. So a few years ago, I wanted to start developing mobile applications. Back then, for some reason, for the Windows Phone 7 operating system. And I didn't understand what I was finding on Google. It was just too advanced for a newbie like me. I just felt overwhelmed, even though I did have some very light programming experience, this just seemed too complicated. And I thought to myself that maybe that was why it was one of the last subjects in college, and I was barely starting out. And then I heard about this event that Nokia was having for developers. Two full days of learning to build Windows Phone 7 and S40 applications, so yeah, a few years ago now. And we would start with Windows Phone. So my mom, with what I'm sure was a ton of effort, gave me just enough money for one day to travel to the big city, get to the event, maybe have something to eat, and return home. So I skipped school that day and went to the event and luckily that day it would be about Windows Phone 7. And I say luckily because literally in just a few minutes the instructor that day had completely changed my life. And I mean this in every sense of the word. In literally just about 30 minutes, this guy perfectly explained how to build Windows Phone 7 apps, and a world of opportunities opened for me. I would then go ahead and build dozens of apps for Windows Phone 7, for Windows Phone 8, for Windows 8 and Windows 8.1, thanks to that single quick lecture. Now, the reason I'm telling you this story is because I want you to have the same opportunity that I did back then. So you too can start building apps and with no need from your loving parents to sacrifice anything because this curse is entirely free. I really hope that this curse does to your professional career what those 30 minutes did for me all those years ago. If you are a complete beginner on app development, I made this course with you in mind. So, after just a few minutes, you unlock a world of possibilities with the apps that you can build. And even better, Summer Informs unlocks more doors today by itself than Windows Phone 7 did back then when I learned about it. So, Summer Informs allows you to build native applications for both Android and iOS reusing 100% of one single code base. So, if you are a complete beginner, this course really is for you. And at the end, you will know how to build iOS apps and build Android apps by 100% reusing C Sharp and SAML code and add SQLite local databases to your apps as well. So I want to help you to jumpstart your mobile app development career. I don't want you to wait for the university to teach you in the last semesters. So act now and start building iOS and Android apps today. So what is Xamarin? That is something that you have to do before anything else. Before we start coding and creating Xamarin applications that will run on both Android and iOS with a single code base, you should know what Xamarin is. Now, of course, Xamarin is a company, and it's a company that was a few years ago acquired by Microsoft. And Xamarin focuses on creating tools for developers, many different sorts of tools. Of course, the most famous of its tools is the one that allows us to create mobile applications. And it actually has a couple of different versions, Xamarin Classic, and summary forms. Now, the one that we're going to be focusing on and the one that seems to be getting more and more traction is summary forms. 
Xamarin Forms allows you to create mobile applications for Android, iOS, and even Windows and more platforms using SAML and C Sharp. And in the next few lectures, we're going to dig a little bit deeper about how it allows you to do that. But in this lecture, I wanted to make clear that Summary Forms is a tool that will allow you to create entirely native applications. Now, how does it achieve it? We're going to take a look at that in a further lecture. For now, just keep in mind that what it will do is grab all of that code that you're going to be creating one single time and compiling it for Android and iOS in an entirely native way. So this was a brief overlook about what Xamarin is. It really is just a tool that will allow you to create Android and iOS apps using one single code base. In the next lectures, we're going to learn why you should use Xamarin, why is it good to use Xamarin, and how is it that Xamarin truly achieves native functionality with shared code. So why Xamarin? Why should you consider using Xamarin over many other different options that are in the market for you to develop mobile applications, including native, entirely native applications? So here is why. First, let's compare it to native. Native development requires you to code once for Android, another one for iOS, another one for Windows, and so on and so forth. So it truly takes a lot of resources and a lot of time from teams and from developers and just freelancers and companies in general. What Xamarin allows you to do is have one single code base, share it 100% throughout all of the operating systems that you want to support and be done with it. And the best thing is that it is truly native which brings me to the comparison to other cross-platform tools. There are other cross-platform tools that allow you to share some code base and deploy it to different platforms. However, Xamarin is one that allows you to do so at the same time that it allows you to build entirely native applications with one single code base. So it's the best of both worlds. Entirely native, great functionality, great use of the resources that the phones, the tablets, and the laptops have, and on the other hand, fewer code, easier to maintain, easier to scale, one single code base, you only code once, not a lot of time, not a lot of resources, and one single developer can actually do applications for both Android and iOS, which are simply the most used platforms out there. You could also deploy to Windows, but let's be honest, not a lot of Windows apps from the App Store, I mean, are really well used. But if you have to support Windows, you can do so with the same single code base. So this is a brief overlook of, of why you should consider Xamarin over native development and over other cross-platform development alternatives. How does Xamarin work? I have mentioned how Xamarin allows you to build for Android, iOS, and even other platforms if you wish to support them with one single code base, and that it creates entirely native applications on top of that. So how does Xamarin achieve this? Well, this has been a work of years. I remember a lot of years ago, well, maybe six years ago when Xamarin was starting out, that it was a bit rough in the edges, like it allowed you to do these things that you, it allows you to do now, but there were a lot of bugs and there weren't the very good integrations with some of the platforms that were out there. Maybe a new version of Android was out, a new version of iOS, and there were really some issues. However, Xamarin has really improved in recent years. And what it does is grab this single code base that is created on C Sharp and SAML and compile it for it to eventually be Java code that runs on Android and Objective-C code that runs on iOS. So this is truly very efficient code that runs entirely native in each platform. And the same for Windows if you want to support Windows. 
So basically what Xamarin does is that it grabs this code that you create on C Sharp and SAML and the entire library is going to compile this down into native code. So it runs as if it were a native application because it actually is a native application. I'll give you a quick example that you're going to take a look at in the coming section when we start defining elements. If in summary forms you define a button that is just called button, when Xamarin builds the application for it to be ran on Android, what it does is that it turns this button into an Android button, an actual widget that will run on Android that the Android ecosystem has always used, the same kind of button that you would define if you were developing entirely native Android applications. And this same button that you define on Xamarin Forms when compiled to run on iOS, it will be translated into a UI button, a button entirely native for iOS, the one, the same one that you would create if you were developing on Xcode. So this is eventually what Xamarin does with your code, which means that you end up with an entirely native application, which of course translates into the application being more efficient and having better access to resources and just working so much better than alternatives. I would say that 99% as good as an entirely native application. Now, of course, there are still some rough edges here and there, barely noticeable. Really, you start to notice them only when you start making crazy things with your application. Overall, Xamarin is a great tool for you to learn and that will easily allow you to deploy your applications for both Android and iOS without spending a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of resources into it. Let's get right into working with Xamarin. Now, of course, the first thing that you will have to do to be able to work with Xamarin is, well, to install Xamarin. And for those of you who have Mac, this is the lecture for you. If you are working on Windows, you can just skip this lecture and go over to the other one, the next one. Now, in the case of Mac, you do need to do a couple of things. The first one actually has very little to do with Xamarin and more to do with Apple. And the fact that if you want to develop iOS apps, you need the iOS SDK and all of the emulators. And that can only be obtained by installing Xcode. This is something that you don't have to do at all in the case of Android. If you're not going to be developing for iOS, but if you are, you will have to install Xcode. Now, if you're going to be working with Windows, you will also have to install this and the Visual Studio, which I'm about to take a look at in just a few seconds, because this, after all, is what is going to be installing all of the iOS tools on your computer. So, for example, right now I have an update for version 10.0. I currently have the version 9. Point something which now includes the ability for us to develop for iOS 12. So iOS 12 has been out for a while for developers, but actually just today, in the moment of recording this lecture on the 17th of September, it was released to the public along with Xcode. So I would want to go ahead and update Xcode, but we just need to come here to the Mac App Store, search for Xcode and install it. Right after installing it, you will be able to navigate to visualstudio.microsoft.com forward slash Xamarin and download Xamarin for Mac. In here you have many options and I find that there's no real reason to select anyone in here. You can just select anyone you want. After all, the difference between community, professional, or enterprise is going to be based on your email account. So if you download the community edition and then you log in with one account that has purchased enterprise, Visual Studio is automatically going to be updated to enterprise. And actually, 
maybe it just unlocks some functionality because it really does nothing it doesn't even reload but just go ahead and download one of these options i suggest you start with the community right away which is going to be more than enough and launch the installer that is going to be downloaded all you will have to do is double click on this download button and when it opens you will see that first the installer is going to go ahead and evaluate what you have installed and what you do not have installed in my case because i already have installed some things previously it says that visual studio for mac is installed some version of ios the dotnet core and android development with summary forms is also installed Optionally, it is telling me that I can install some in Workbooks and Inspector and tools for macOS. These are not going to be used in the course, so we can deselect them. I see some updates available to my Android SDK, so I could go ahead and select this one. Basically, what you have to make sure that you do in here is that you install Android, iOS and the .NET Core. This is going to be absolutely necessary for you to continue with the curse. So go ahead and select that and hit on install. Of course, depending on how much you're going to be installing and your internet speed, this is going to take a few minutes. But after that is done, you can select to open Visual Studio immediately after, which I am going to do so I can get started right away with Xamarin development. After the download is successful, you will see right here that you get Visual Studio open right away. And like I said, if you go ahead and log in, you are going to see a small tag up here of the version of Visual Studio that you have on your account. You notice how I downloaded the Community Edition yet after logging in I see Enterprise. So there you have it. Like I said, in the next lecture, we're going to take a look at how you can install on Windows. But if you are not going to be using Windows, you are entirely good to go. In the next lecture, after the next lecture, then we're going to be starting right away by creating a new project here on Mac. OK, so what we're going to do in this lecture is go ahead and install Visual Studio tools for Xamarin on a Windows computer. Now, just so you are not confused by what we're seeing here, I actually have Windows running on Parallels on my Mac, so that is why you see this being on my Mac, but this is actually Windows. You can see that this is Microsoft Edge. You see the close buttons over here to the, to the right corner, so this is Windows. It's just I am running it right here on my Mac with Parallels. But basically, you're going to have to do something very similar. We are going to be navigating to Visual Studio .microsoft .com forward slash Xamarin. And here you're going to find the download for Windows button. So this same page is going to identify whether you're on Windows or on Mac and prompt you to download the version for that specific operating system. So again, you can select the Community Edition, download, and as soon as it is downloaded, run the installer. And you will see something very similar to this. Now, it is in here where you have to make sure that you select the correct things that have to be installed. And what you will have to go ahead and search for is the mobile and gaming section and select the mobile development with .NET option, which actually has the summary icon in that element listed in here. Now, actually, what you can do in here optionally is select the universal Windows platform development option if you want to create Windows application with summary forms. We're not going to be covering that in that in this course. However, that is something that you could do. I am not going to be selecting it, but it is important that you know that you can do that. Other than that, you can just go ahead and make sure that you select Android, Java, Google Android emulators, the Intel Hardware Accelerated Execution Manager, Haxer, is very important you, that you select this one. And again, if you want to develop for Windows 10, you can select Universal Windows Platform Tools for Xamarin. Other than that, you are good to go. You are just going to need to hit on the install. Notice that the installation is quite big at 15 gigabytes. 
basically because some other tools are going to be installed. I do recommend that you leave those selected and just make sure that you have enough space available and hit on install. Of course, this is going to take a bit more time than on Mac, but after a few minutes, you should also see Visual Studio start right after the installation, just like we saw on Mac in the previous lecture. Now, while the installation finishes, let me just mention that while this installer is going to install pretty much everything that you need, if you want to develop for iOS as well, which I assume is going to be your case, you would absolutely need a Mac computer. So what you would have to do is, and we're going to take a look at this in the lecture where we test iOS applications directly from Windows, is to connect somehow to a Mac computer. I do recommend here a couple of things. One, that if you do, do not own a Mac computer, you borrow one from a friend once in a while for you to test your application. Again, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a specific lecture. Uh, and two, if you do not own a computer and none of your friends owns a computer or your university cannot lend you a computer or your work cannot lend you a computer, Mac in Cloud is the option. So Mac in Cloud is the service that allows you to rent, and let me actually navigate over to macincloud.com. So macincloud.com will allow you to rent a Mac in the cloud. And you could I, could, I think it's $1 per hour. So maybe at the beginning, a simple $1 per hour, you don't even have to buy a plan, a complete plan. Maybe just use it for one or two hours once in a while. And that's going to be enough. In fact, you can see how it is tailored for Xamarin as well. Eventually, you could also pay $20 per month if you need a little bit more. So as you can see, you can set a pay-as-you-go subscription, $1 per hour, or a managed server for $20 per hour, which gives you pretty much the same thing, except I think you have unlimited hours. So you would have to come here and figure out which is it that you want to use, but that is the best option that I think you have available in case you cannot get your hands on a Mac computer. So as you can see, the installation is about to finish up in here. So we should see Visual Studio open in just a few seconds. And here we go. After just a few seconds, Visual Studio asked me to log in. And after I did, here I am on Visual Studio 2017 for Windows. So this is how you install for Windows. Again, just make sure that if you're going to be developing for iOS as well, you get a Mac somehow. And once you have a Mac, you will have to follow the steps that I detailed in the previous lecture. So you get your Mac ready for Xamarin development as well. Now, in the next lecture, we're going to create our first Xamarin project. All right, so in the previous section, we already went ahead and installed Visual Studio for Mac, as well as Visual Studio on our Windows PC. Now, I am mostly going to be working here in Visual Studio for Mac, but anything that I know that is quite different in Visual Studio 2017 that is on Windows, I am going to do it on Windows as well. And you will notice that the difference is pretty much only in the UI. Maybe some menus are going to be a little bit different. Eventually, this is Xamarin, this is C Sharp, this is going to be XAML for the UI. It is going to be identical. So let's get started right away. I'm going to go ahead and create a new project here in Visual Studio for Mac. You can do it from the new project button that I have right here, or you could also go to File and click on New Solution. Here, the first thing that I will have to do is navigate over to the multi-platform section, select App, and I am going to start with a blank forms application. Now, you will notice that there are some other options in here, and this is going to vary on Windows. So in the next lecture, I am going to do this for Windows as well. But notice that you could also create a master details form application. 
This is simply a list of options that navigate over to the detail. So the master is the list, the detail is the option that you selected, similar to what you may see on the settings application. There is also a tabbed forms application. This is the one that has many different tabs and each tab has a different detail page associated to it. Maybe similar to what you would see on the music application, on the Spotify application, the Facebook application. I'm talking about iOS in here on Android. There are also some applications that are tabbed. And then you see some options for a native. Now, we, we briefly talked about the difference between native and summary forms. We are going to be focusing on summary forms, however, because it's just, I find it, it's easier, it's more efficient, and it's generally the option that you are going to be selecting. So let's go ahead and click on next and give our application a name. This is going to be a simple contacts application. The organization identifier, you will likely want to change this because this may be something that makes no sense to you. So I have changed this to a reverse URL that I have here for my website, which is lalorosas.com. So now this is going to be com.lalorosas. And eventually notice this is going to be translated into this organization identifier plus your app's name. So just make sure that you set this correctly. Now I'm going to leave both Android and iOS as the target platforms and use .NET Standard as the shared code. The difference between .NET Standard and the shared library is that the shared library is basically going to move everything that we create in that shared code over to Android and iOS entirely, while using .NET Standard will create a package and that package will be referenced to Android and iOS. So I find again that generally it is .NET standard, the one that you want to select. So we're going to go ahead and click on next. And finally, just set things up in here, whether we want a different name for the project than for the solution, this is generally not the case. Whether you want the location of the project to be somewhere else, if you want to add version control with Git, for now, let's just hit on create. And the project is going to be created with actually the solution with three projects. So the solution is going to be one file that is going to have an SLN extension. And this notice over here to the left is going to contain the other three projects. And this is going to be the same on Windows as well. So now that I have made this text larger, you can definitely notice over here in the solution that is containing the .NET standard project or the shared project in case you selected that, which I hope you didn't. Then the contacts.android project, which of course is going to be the Android project and the iOS project. So you're going to learn what each of these projects is going to eventually do as we progress through the course. For now, let's just notice that we're going to be focusing on the .NET standard project. Like I said, it is going to be in here where we're going to be working entirely with our code. Eventually, from this project, both the Android and the iOS projects are going to be building the application per platform. You can notice that both of these platforms in the references reference that contacts.net standard project. So this is how the code is going to be reused between the platforms. And that inside of the contacts.net standard project, we're going to be working with pages. So by default, we're going to have the main page that it's divided into files, that SAML file, that is going to be the one used to define the UI of our application, and the C sharp file, which is going to be used to define the logic, the functionality of the application. We're going to be working with these two files as well as, as some other files that we're going to be creating that are going to be pages. For now, you have already created your project. And by the way, notice that if you navigate over to the SAML file, your main page.saml file, the reviewer doesn't really work. This is because you have to rebuild your project. So the first time your project is created, you have to rebuild it. And you can just simply click here on the rebuild project button or you can go ahead and right click on the solution 
select clean contacts, I do recommend that you first clean up the solution and then hit on rebuild contacts, which is the name of the entire solution. And once the project has been rebuilt, the previewer is going to be reloaded. We will see how the render is going to be initialized. In this case, I am with iOS selected. And after a few seconds, we see this up and running. Now, like I said, right now I'm on iOS, but I can also take a look at the same result on Android. And here is where you start to notice how the, the exact same code is going to be working for both platforms. Now, in the next lecture, actually in the next lecture, we're going to be doing this for Windows in case you're on Windows. But the lecture after that, we're going to be working with new controls. So you're going to familiarize yourself with what the hell this code is about and how it is going to be working on both Android and iOS. By the way, notice I have some updates in here. For now, let's just go ahead and move over to the next lecture in case you need to know how to create the project on Windows. If not, feel free to skip that lecture and go over right away to adding some controls to this contacts application that we're going to be building throughout the course. So we have already installed Visual Studio on Windows and on Mac if you're using that operating system it is time for us to create a new project. Now, creating a project on Windows for Samurai Forms is a bit different than doing it from a Mac. So let me explain how to do that here on Windows. I have here Visual Studio opened. And notice that immediately you have the new project section where you can select one of the most used templates or simply hit on create a new project. You can always, if for some reason you don't see this start page, go to file, select new and select project. So let's go ahead and do so. From this window is from where you will be able to find the cross platform option. And here it is very straightforward. You actually only see one option, the mobile app for summary forms. Here, all you have to do is set some name. Let's call this contacts. You can optionally initialize a Git repository, create a directory for the solution, maybe name a different location where this project is going to be created. Let's just go ahead and click on OK for now. And here is the interesting part. This is where creating this is slightly different than doing it from Mac. Here is where you would have to select the template. Just like on Mac, you will be able to see master detail and tapped options. And just like on Mac, we're going to stick to a blank template. Now in here, you also have the ability to select whether you're going to use .NET Standard or Share Project. Again, we're going to be selecting .NET Standard. However, in here, you have a bit of more control. You can select whether to create an Android or an iOS application. Both should be selected. Now, in addition, because when installing my Visual Studio, I installed the Windows tools, I have Windows listed in here. Yes, if you use Samurai Forms, you can not only create for Android and iOS, you can also create for Windows. I am not going to leave this selected because I am not going to be creating any Windows application. We're going to focus on Android and iOS. And that's it. We can now just simply click on OK and three projects are going to be created, just like on Mac. We're going to have the iOS project, the Android project and the shared project in the form of a .NET standard project. After a few seconds, then you are going to see here the solution. Just like on Mac, a solution is going to be created. Again, there are some differences between Mac and Windows in the menus, in the templates. But eventually, this is the same Summer Informs project. You're going to see exactly the same. And it is going to be exactly the same from now on. I will add uh, maybe a few seconds 
on how to do something on Windows if it is different than doing it on Mac. Apart from that, everything is going to be exactly the same. You may see that the templates create a slightly different thing here and there, but eventually we see the exact same thing. Now, before moving forward, I do want to mention that here on the SAML file, by default, you are not going to see any designer as you do on Mac. In the next lecture, we're going to be focused on creating new controls. On Mac, you're going to see the designer immediately. Here on Windows, you will have to navigate over to the bottom right corner of this part of the window where we have the SAML file and click on this little double arrow button that says Expand Pane. If you do so, here you will be able to see the designer. And you will also have the ability to see it for Android and for iOS. Now, doing so for iOS is going to be slightly more complicated than on Mac. On Mac it works immediately. In the section about testing, we're going to talk about how we are going to be able to see this. For now, just rest assured that whatever you see on Android is going to be exactly the same on iOS. So this is how you see the designer. And in fact, you have a bit more control here in Visual Studio 2017 on Windows. You have this small icon, uh, this button that allows you to change from having the designer on the left to the right. And you have some options in here to change from a vertical to a horizontal split. This may not be that good unless you have a vertical setup, your vertical monitor, but it is here. Now that you have created the project either on Windows or on Mac, let's jump over to the next lecture and start adding some controls. We have already created this new project either on Mac or on Windows, and we see that there is a slight difference on what Windows and Mac create right here in the content page, but mainly we should be able to see the identical, the same thing on both Android and iOS. Now, during this section, precisely, we're going to focus on the SAML files, but I do want to start right from the beginning, so I am going to delete anything that is here inside of the content page. So let me just do that again. Notice that inside of the content page, we see some element that in the case of Mac, this is a stack layout, and inside there is a label. Now you don't have to worry about what these are yet, let's just go ahead and delete them. And all we're going to see now is the definition of this XML file, or you know, the version, the encoding, and the content page. The content page is important here because this is exactly what defines the page inside of Samurai Forms. And you can see that the important thing in here is the definition of the class. So inside of the content page, we see the definition of a class that happens to be exactly the main page that we have in contacts, the C sharp file, the C sharp class that we have here. Now we're eventually going to learn a bit more about how these two files communicate, the SAML and the c -sharp file. For now, you should just keep in mind that this is going to be important, the definition of what class this content page is going to be representing. Also notice that the main page inherits from content page, which, which means that main page is a content page, which is exactly the same type of the element that is being defined in here. Now, there are many different types of pages. One could be the tabbed page, which actually has some tabs inside of the UI. The content page is the regular, most common page. So now that we understand a bit more about this content page, let's go ahead and define things inside of it. For example, we can define things like entries, and this is how we define an element. We start with an open angle bracket, the name of the element, then a forward slash, and then the closing angle bracket. So this is actually going to define an entry, and it's hard to notice because it 
currently is using the entire the entire page. It is probably easier to notice on Android. Notice that all the way to the bottom, there is this line that defines the entry in Android. On iOS, we really see no difference. Maybe if you get really close, you see a small curved line in the edges, defining precisely what the entry is going to look like. But this is probably not what we are looking for. Now, in the next lecture, we're going to learn how to make this look better. For now, let's just focus on the notation of how we are defining these SAML elements. Notice that the way I define the entry is different from the way the content page is defined. Now, the content page is defined in this way because it needs elements inside of it. We could definitely just define the content page like this. Notice that I changed the way the content page is defined simply by changing how I close the definition. Instead of closing it in another tag, I am closing it directly right here, just like I defined first the entry. Now, if I go back to what I had before, this is the other way in which you can close the definition of an element. And we could do the same with an entry. We could have the opening tag and then the closing tag like this. So this is going to result in the exact same thing, just with a little bit more of code. Let's say that in here, inside of the entry, I want to define its text. So we could do it similar to what we just did by defining it like this. And inside of these two brackets or inside of these two tags, define the text, let's say hello. And notice that it is immediately applied inside of the designer. Now, this is the entire definition, like the complete XAML definition of the text of the entry. However, this is just way too much. Instead of defining the variable or the text property value like this, I could define it right here in the definition of the entry, like this. And you see that the result is exactly the same. So we see a little bit less code. And the same with the entry, I could define it just in the same line by closing it like this instead of with the entire tag. And we see that the result is exactly the same. So this is pretty much the syntax that we're going to be using every single time. Now, there are going to be some elements. One of them we're going to take a look at in the next lecture that definitely require us to use the syntax, the one that is used for the content page, because we need to define some elements inside of it. In the case of most of the elements, though, the ones that are not containers are going to be defined like this very quickly. So this is how you define elements. Now, before moving forward to the next lecture, let me just try to define another element in here. Let's say that we're going to define a button and notice that the entry disappeared. Now it is not really that it disappeared as much as the button is now on top of it. Let's add, for example, some text to the button that is going to be click me. You can see that we see the button, we see its text. It's now that the button is using the entire available space with no regard of the entry and the same happens with Android as well. So what we're going to learn in the next lecture is how to use one of the containers that will allow us to make this UI actually work. That container is the stack layout and it's going to help us stack these elements together. In the next lecture, then we're going to learn how that stack layout works. So in the previous lecture, we defined an entry and a button inside of the content page. We learned a bit about how we're going to be defining these SAML elements, and we learned a couple of different ways in which we can have the syntax. Now, we also noticed that when we created the button, the entry disappeared. And I mentioned that it's not as much as it disappears as it's being covered by the button. 
So during this lecture, we're going to take a look at one container, this tag layout container, that will help us solve this quite easily. So let's just get started. The thing that we're going to be doing in here is defining a new element that is going to be a container that is going to be called stack layout. Now, because this is a container, you may remember that I mentioned it is going to be defined like this. It's going to have an opening tag and a closing tag because inside of it, we're going to be defining things. And precisely the things that we're going to be defining are these two elements that we have. Now notice that immediately, and let me just move this or indent these two elements in here. Notice that immediately we see now that these two elements are stacked together. And in fact, their heights are changed. Now the heights are the regular heights for the entry or for the button. We no longer see using the entire available page instead of the content page. And this is going to be stacked, of course, the first element defined inside of this container is going to be the one all the way to the top of the container and the next one at the bottom of that and so on and so forth. Now, right now, the container is the one that is going to be using the entire available space. This could change if, for example, inside of the content page, we had more elements. So, for example, if this stack layout were inside of another stack layout, let me just define the stack layout like this and indent this stack layout. And instead of the first stack layout, I had another entry. We can see that now this stack layout is different. It is no longer using the entire available space. It is using the available space after this entry has been added to the UI. So hopefully this starts to make a little bit more sense. You can start to define elements and the stack layout is going to help you stack elements together. Now, there is another thing that I want to do in here before moving forward. And let me just head back to the definition that I had before with this entry and the button. Right now, we do see that the UI on both on Android and iOS does look the way it's supposed to for both of the platforms, but I don't like the fact that there is no margin to the sides of these elements. Like they are defined all the way to the sides and to the top of the UI. This doesn't look particularly good to me. So to the stack layout, I am simply going to add some margin. Now, if we, when defining the margin, I set simply one value, let's say 20, this margin is going to be applied to all four sides, to the left, to the right, to the top and to the bottom. I could, however, also define two values, let's say 20 and 10 separated by a comma. The 20 will be used to set the margin for the left and for the right. And the 10 is going to be used to define the margin for the top and for the bottom. And finally, I could also define all four sides. For example, let's just define 20 for the left, 20 for the top, 20 for the right, and zero for the bottom. Now this is going to look very much the same as if I had just 120, except for the bottom margin, which is going to be zero. This is how I want to leave the margin in here. And notice that this margin is applied to the stack layout. And because it is applied to the stack layout, now the, the elements defined inside of it are going to respect that margin. I could also add some extra margin to the elements inside of the stack layout. Let's say, for example, that I want some additional top margin for the bottom. So it's a bit more separated from the entry. I could do it like this. But mainly, I believe, is in the containers where you want to set these margins and have the elements inside of these containers respect those margins and maybe eventually apply some margins on themselves, but more for separating them vertically, not horizontally. So we have now defined this stack layout. 
In the next lecture, we're going to complete this definition of this main page that eventually, by the way, is going to help us add new contacts. These eventually, actually, let me just change the value already. Let's just call this save. But we will need a few more entries. And more importantly, we're going to have to know when this button is clicked. That is what we're going to learn in the next lecture to know when one button is going to be pressed. So eventually we know that in that moment, we have to save this new contact that may be created from this main page. We have already started to define this main page that will eventually be the page from where the user is going to save new contacts. We do need some other things for this main page to be enough for us to save contacts starting with more entries because right now we only have one. I do want to make a couple of changes in here. The entry, first of all, is no longer going to have a text, but it is going to have a placeholder, letting the user know what this entry is going to be about. And the first one is going to be the name. The second change that I want to make is more like an addition. I want more entries in here, a few more entries in here. Of course, each of these entries is going to have a different placeholder. Let's say that this is going to be for the last name. We're also going to have a placeholder for the email. Let's add one for the phone number and maybe one for the address. And eventually we do have this save button. And now this looks more like a page from where we would add new contacts and you can see how the result for Android is pretty much the same, of course, with native controls. But the more important thing here is that we need to know when the save button is pressed. So in this lecture, I'm going to be creating an event handler. In Xamarin, events are going to be triggered when a certain action is performed. And in the case of the button, the clicked event is going to be triggered when the user presses the button. So this is exactly the event that we need to handle. Now notice that as I right clicked in here, there is a small helper from Visual Studio that is telling me, do you want to create an event handler? And it is actually going to go ahead and name this event handler for us. It is going to be called handle underscore clicked. Now, if I had many buttons, this really doesn't tell me that much. So I do recommend that before doing anything, you name your button. What I'm going to do in here, and let me just make this definition correctly because I removed the forward slash, is name my button. And we can do it by writing x colon name. And my button, I do recommend that always starts with what this button is going to do. Let's say that this is going to be the safe and that always contains the name or the type of the element, in this case, button. So now my save button, well, it's called a save button. It makes entire sense for us to call the button that is going to be saving a contact save button. This could even be called save contact button if we have many different save buttons all over our application. But save button is going to be enough for this particular case. And so now when we want to create the clicked event, we can create the event handler. And notice that immediately before doing anything else, you can navigate it over to the main page the C sharp file to be a little bit more specific. Here, notice the blue indication in here. It is telling us to use the arrow keys to position our event handler. Then to press enter to select the location or press escape to cancel this operation. I recommend that everything, every method, every event handler that you define inside of a class in general goes below the constructor. So in, in this case, I'm going to be positioning my event handler below the main page constructor. 
And what I want you to do in here is change the name because again, this is handle clicked, which makes no real sense. I recommend that you change this to the name of your button. This is save button underscore clicked. So this makes a little bit more sense. You can understand what this method is about. This is the event handler for the click of the save button. Now, if you change this name over here in C sharp, you want to do the same thing over here in SAML. So the clicked event is pointing to exactly the same event handler that we have over in C sharp. If you want to create this event handler from Windows, by the way, you will have to do something very similar. On the bottom, you will have to access the clicked event handler. And from here, notice that you have also the new event handler option. Now, before doing it on Windows, let me actually show you that on Windows, we have a slight advantage to our Mac counterpart. If we set the name before creating the event handler, Let's say that this is going to be the save button too. We can simply write clicked again. And when the new event handler is created, notice that first we don't have to go ahead and select where this is going to be created. And second, the name is already set to that name that we have for the button. We didn't have to change it. Automatically, it is save button underscore clicked. And notice that also the C-sharp file was opened over here. And automatically, this event handler was positioned below the constructor. So as you can see, it's a little bit faster doing it on Windows. Eventually, though, you do see exactly the same result. This is how you will be able to handle your clicks. Anything that you want to do when the save button is pressed is going to be executed inside of these two curly brackets. So all the functionality that you want to execute for saving is going to be in here. Just this is how you can do this. Now we have this UI pretty much ready. We have learned how to define elements. And of course we have only used three of them, a stack layout, as a container, and an entry and a button, there are many other elements that you could add, like labels, lists, switches, date and time selectors, etc. For now, this is going to be enough for us to create a content. Of course, we're not yet able to save anything because our save button event handler doesn't really do anything yet. But in the next section, we're going to start to work a little bit more with the functionality of our application. Particularly, we're going to finish up the navigation so we have another page where eventually the contacts are going to be listed and this page where the contacts are going to be created. For now, you should be more familiar with SAML, how to define the UI of your Xamarin applications. Now, in the next lecture, it's going to be quite clear how it is that you're going to be working with the functionality. So in the previous section, we went ahead and learned a little bit more about SAML. We learned how we can define elements. We learned to use the stack layout, which is a container. And we even went ahead and created an event handler for the clicked event of the button. Precisely when we created this event handler, we were navigated over to the C-sharp file corresponding to this page, which is the main page .saml.cs file, to select where we wanted this event handler to be created. After we selected that, and Windows might have been a little bit different, we saw this method being created. So during this section, what we're going to do is focus on the C-sharp part of our application. We are going to be doing a bit of work with SAML, but we're going to be focusing on making some changes to the application and its functionality. So we have it pretty much ready in the way it's going to look like and how it is going to navigate from one page to another. So the first thing that I want to show you is that this event handler could have been created from C sharp. And this starts over in the SAML file 
by us naming the button. As soon as we name our elements, we are going to be able to access them from the C-sharp file. This means that since our button already has a name, we could go ahead, let's say here in the constructor and write save button and notice that it is right there. We can find it right there in the list because Visual Studio is going to help us do that and now start working with it. Now, just like on SAML, we were able to access the clicked event by writing one of the attributes for the button. On C Sharp, we can write a dot and search for the exact same event. In fact, you see a list of all of the events, all of the properties and all of the methods that are precisely right here inside of the button. As we progress through the course, we're going to take a look at some of these properties for some of the elements. In the button, most of the time, you're going to just want to work with a clicked event. Now on C Sharp, creating an event handler is a little bit different. Here, what you have to do is write a space plus equal space again. And notice that Visual Studio is again going to help us create this event handler, but slightly different to what it did with SAML. First, it actually lists a bit more options for us to create this event handler. The first one is to create a new method, which is exactly what we did with SAML. But with C Sharp, we have a few more options. We can create a Lambda expression or an async Lambda expression, even an async delegate. Now, we are not going to be focusing on what each and every one of these things are or even what Lambda or async or delegate means. Let's just for now focus on the fact that you can create a method. And notice that the rest is going to be exactly the same. You will have to select where that method is going to be located and this is going to be created. So here is how you create that event handler here in C Sharp. I do recommend that as long as you can do so, you stick to creating these event handlers from SAML. So that is what we are going to be living in here. I just wanted to mention that you can do this on C Sharp as well. Now, let me also mention something very important in here. You may be wondering how is it that just by writing a name on an element here on SAML magically, they are available right here on the C Sharp file. And in fact, if you notice, they are available as fields for this particular class. That means that they are somehow defined inside of this same class. So is there just some magic happening that allows SAML to suddenly create variables or fields inside of the C-sharp file? Well, yes, but it's not as magical as you may think. There is some automation going on, but there's definitely an explanation. So what I want you to do is go ahead and select your contacts project. Not the solution, by the way, the project, the one that is the shared one. Right click and select reveal in Finder so we can take a look at the entire project. Now in here, you're going to find some files that are not listed in Visual Studio. They are hidden. Now, by the way, to do the same thing on Windows, you could just navigate over to your file explorer and find your project. Typically, it is going to be on Documents, Visual Studio 2017, and Projects. Mine is not here, but this is typically where you will have it. Mine is already on my repos folder. However, if you're on Windows, there is a faster way. Right from Visual Studio, you can select your contacts project from the Solution Explorer and find this icon that is called Show All Files. If you select it, you are going to find here those files that are not displayed by default, including the OBG folder that we're about to talk about. So let's jump back 
over to my Mac because from here on out it's just the same thing. The only difference is how you jump over to these files, but notice that in here you have, for example, the bin folder that is not listed, the obg folder that is not listed, the others are simply the app.saml and the main page.saml and main page.saml.cs that we do have access to. Now what I want you to do is go ahead and open the obg folder. In here, open the debug folder and the netstandard 2.0 folder. Notice that here there are some files that are complementary to the app class and to the main page class. So there is actually a main page.saml.g.cs file in here. And the same for the app class, but I want you to focus on this main page class or C chart file. This is actually defining a little bit more about the same main page class that we have been working with. Let me actually go ahead and open this with Visual Studio. And actually, let me just go ahead and use any tool that I have here to take a look at it. This notice is also defining the main page class. And I will talk a little bit more about this in just a second. But notice that it is in here where the save button is being defined. So it turns out that as we add names to the elements inside of our SAML file, automatically Xamarin is generating these fields. This save button was added automatically without us having to do anything as soon as we set the name over in the SAML file. This is how we are able to go ahead and from the main page.saml.cs file, use this save button. So a little bit more about the explanation. Notice that this class, the main page, is a partial class. The fact that this class is defined as partial is the thing that enables us, or through C sharp enables the compiler to define one class in many different files. And the same thing would happen, by the way, with methods. We could define partial methods that are defined in many different places. Right now, Xamarin is using this feature of C Sharp to be able to define one part of the main page in here, hidden from the user, and the other one, let me just navigate over here, here, just in the main page.saml.cs. As you can see, it is marked partial here as well. So that is why, by having two files for the main page class, we can have this save button definition kind of hidden, but being able to use it without any problem from the main page.saml.cs. So hopefully you now understand a bit better about what kind of magic was going on in here. The main thing that I want to mention is that now you should understand that if we want to access the properties for these entries, let's say that the text that the user wrote down, so eventually we save the contact, we would need to add their names. We don't need to name these entries yet, but we will have to do so eventually. For now, in the next lecture, we're going to be working on changing what the first page is going to be by creating a new page inside of our project. We have a definition of a main page since we created the project. This main page is created immediately when we create this Android and iOS projects. So that means that if we run this application, this is the only page that will appear and the first page that will appear, of course. Now, this doesn't make a lot of sense if we think about it, if we run an application to add new contacts, the first thing that should appear is not the add new contact page. Now, I did start to define this in the main page. I could have created a different one, but that means that we should create another page that eventually will list this element. And in fact, change the first page to be that new page. So let's take this step by step. 
and let's first create a new page. So here in the contacts project, I am going to right click, select add, select new file. And in here, I have the option to select from forms, some different files for content pages. In fact, you see two of them for content pages and two of them for content views. Let's focus on the content page for now. Here, I am going to see that two options are pretty much identical except for one that says SAML. So what is the difference? The difference is that if we select the forms content page option, we are going to be creating a page, but that page will not have a SAML file. The page will have to be defined entirely on C Sharp. It is the other one, the one that we want the one that creates both a SAML and a C-sharp file. So let's go ahead and select that one and set the name to contacts page. Now let me show you how to do this exact same thing on Windows. To create this new page in Windows 10, you would also have to go to your contact project, right click on it, select add, and in this case, select new item. The templates on Windows are going to be a bit different, but you can also find summary forms here to the left and see that there is also a content page and a content page C Sharp. These are the same that we have just found on summary forms over on Mac. The content page is the one that is going to create both a SAML and a C Sharp file. And you can see that the extension is actually a SAML. If you select the C Sharp file, this is the one that will make you define the page through C Sharp entirely. So just make sure that you select content page and that you name this contact space and click on add. Now let's jump back over to Mac. On either Windows or Mac, now that you have the name of the file, let's just go ahead and click on new and we will now be able to see this C Sharp file with a new contacts page that inherits from the content page, just like the main page, as well as its XAML file. So we now have this entire new page. However, even if we have created this new page, we still don't have any way to navigate to it. And in fact, we shouldn't navigate to it as much as it is the first page that is displayed to the user. So how do we change that? Because right now, by default, it is the main page, the one that is showed first. Well, to change this, we will have to navigate over to the other application files that were already here the moment we created this project. And that is the app.saml.cs file. There is this other app class inside of my project that was created by default that will be very useful for us in a couple of scenarios for now. Let's just notice that in the in its constructor, there is a definition of the main page. The main page is a property of the app class that defines what page is the first to be displayed. In this case, it is set to the default main page. What we can do is change it to another page. Now in here, we could simply set this to a new contacts page, which is the one that we have just created. However, if we need some navigation inside of our application, we should do something slightly different. Now, the next explanation is going to make more sense if you have experience with iOS. So if you have experience with iOS, you can just very easily grasp the idea that I'm about to explain. If not, just bear with me and be a little bit patient. So what we need to do here is set the main page first to a navigation page. This doesn't mean that we need another page, that the navigation page is going to be displayed, but that the navigation page is going to help us manage all the navigation. Similar to what happens with iOS, with Xamarin, we're going to need kind of like the navigation manager in iOS, 
it is called a navigation controller. And the navigation controller can have a root page, the one that is actually displayed at the beginning. And the root page in our case should be the contacts page. So let me go ahead and define that. Instead of setting this to a new main page, I am going to set this to a navigation page. I notice that the constructor has an option or an override that is going to be receiving the page that is going to be the root. Here is where I can set this to a new contacts page. What this means is that the, the navigation page is going to be created and assigned to the main page. The main page that is the property of the app. However, the navigation page, again, is not something that we see as much as it's something that is going to manage the navigation. We are setting the root page that is the first page that is going to be displayed. Now, what the navigation page will help us do is that as we navigate to other pages, we automatically will see, for example, in the case of iOS, that a back button is added, that a title bar is added. So everything is done for us by just setting the main page to a new navigation page. Now, this is, of course, going to be way, way clearer when we start testing our application. For now, just bear in mind that the navigation page is not something that we are going to see. Its root is the one that we're going to see. And this is how you change the first page that is going to be displayed to the user. Now it is not longer going to be the main page. Now it is going to be the contacts page through the navigation page, which will now enable us to perform some navigation quite easily. Now, in the next lecture, let's go ahead and start adding that navigation. What we're going to do is start working with a toolbar. In the previous lecture, we created a new page, the contacts page. This is the one that is going to be displayed the very first time the application is opened. So every time the application is opened, this is the one that is going to be displayed. That means that from this page, we're going to need uh, an add button or a new button or a new contact button that eventually navigates us to the main page. So that is what we're going to add in this lecture. Now, before doing anything, let me go ahead and build my contacts project. So the SAML file is identified and eventually I can see this designer working. There we go. Now, what I want to do in here is not simply add a button the way we have done it earlier in the other page. What I want to do is make use of a toolbar. You may notice in many applications on both Android and iOS, there's a bar at the top or maybe sometimes at the bottom of the page. And in this bar is where we find some of the buttons that are going to be executing some functionality. There is rarely an add button in the main section of the page. It is on those bars. So let's go ahead and add one of these bars with one of those buttons. These bars and those buttons are actually defined outside of the content of the content page. So the content is the one that we have been working with. Now, if I navigate to main page, I don't see the content page dot content as I said here in the page that was created. You may not even see this on some templates, maybe on Windows, maybe on some other versions of Visual Studio, this is not created. But actually, this is not necessary because the content is the default property to be set from the content page, which means that this that we have right here is being automatically, without us having to specify it, defined as the content of the content page which means that having this is the same thing as having content page content right here as having this. And let me just change the indentation in here. So this is going to have the exact 
same result. But we don't need to do this. Our definition could be simplified by simply not including the definition of the content. And now my indentation is all wrong in here. There we go. So we don't need the definition of the content in here. What we do need in this case is the definition of the toolbar items. So the toolbar items is a different property similar to the content of the content page. It is in here where we are going to be defining toolbar items. Now, as you can see, these are not particularly well displayed in the designer. We don't see anything added to the designer because this is outside of the content. For us to see this, we would have to run the application. We will learn how to test it in the next section. For now, let's just focus on just adding some text in here. And the text is going to be, let's say, new. Now, you could also add some icons in here. You would have to have, of course, the icon on the project. We're not going to be focusing on that for now. We are just also going to be creating a clicked event handler like this, just as we did with the button that we have on the main page. Now, let me just remove this line so my event handler is completely empty and change its name. Let's say that this is going to be the new contact toolbar item clicked event handler, which now helps me understand very well what this method is about. So this is how you create a toolbar item. Like I mentioned, it's not something that we can see on either Android or iOS yet, but in the next section, we are going to take a look at how it works. What we are going to be able to do now is navigate from this method to the other page, because precisely when you click this new contact toolbar item, you want to be navigated over to the main page, which should actually be called new contact page, but whatever. So we add new contacts. That is exactly what we're going to do in the next lecture. Now that we have this new button, we can from the main page to which we will eventually navigate, add new contacts. So in the next lecture, the navigation and the UI for our application is going to be pretty much ready. We already have this new content page that is going to be displaying that new button. And of course, we have the main page that is going to be helping us or the users add new contacts. In the next lecture, we're simply going to complete the navigation so we can later focus on adding the functionality. So we already defined the contacts page. And here in the contacts page, we're going to have this toolbar item that is going to be used to navigate over to the main page. It is the new or the new contact button that users will press when they want to add a new contact. And it is from the main page from where they will be able to do so. They, well, we have already defined here the entries and the button to do so. In fact, the navigation is now going to be quite easy because we have already defined the main page of our app to be a navigation page. That starts at its root, the contacts page. Now, because we have this navigation page, when we, from the contacts page, navigate over to the main page, the navigation page is going to do all of the heavy lifting. It's going to have a history of navigation so we eventually can navigate back. It's actually going to add the back button automatically and is actually going to handle that back navigation as well when the user presses on that button. All we have to do is call one single line of code, which is what we will have to add in the event handler for the click of the new contact toolbar item that we have defined. That line of code is actually going to be coming from the navigation property of the contacts page. So any page, because it inherits from a content page or a different kind of page, 
will have a navigation property. This is coming directly from the parent. It's not something that is defined inside the contacts page itself. Actually, it's not something that is defined in the content page. It is something that is defined in the page which the content page inherits from. And the navigation property is going to contain some different methods, but the one that we're looking for right now is the push async method. The push async method is the one that in its arguments is going to ask for the page to which we are going to be navigating to. Now we could also set the navigation to be animated. That is not going to be necessary. Really everything that we have to do here is create a new main page, just like this. And again, all of the heavy lifting is going to be performed by the navigation page. Now our navigation is ready. Literally, all we had to do was add that line of code. Now, the main page of the entire application is a navigation page. And the navigation page has a root page that is going to be the one to be displayed first, the contacts page. And from the contacts page, we are already navigating over to the main page. And like I said, with the help of the navigation page, the main page will now have a back button, which allows navigation back to the contacts page. This is going to be much clearer in the next section when we start testing this functionality. For now, rest assured that our navigation and our UI is pretty much at 100%. All we have to do now is start working with saving contacts, reading them, and eventually adding some more UI by listing those contacts. This is how easy it is to perform navigation on Xamarin Forms. So we have already defined the contacts page as well as the main page, of course. But so far, at least in the contacts page, we are not able to see anything because we are working with a toolbar. And the toolbar is actually only going to be displayed inside of the title bar that gets added because of the navigation page. So during this section, what we're going to be doing is testing our application. During this lecture, we're going to start by testing it on Android. So far, if you remember, all we really have is the navigation. We are pushing over to the main page from the contacts page through the new contact toolbar item. This would mean that, uh, by the way, from the application, the app class, we are setting the main page to be, well, actually a navigation page, but the navigation page has the contacts page as its root, which means that the contacts page is going to be the first page we navigate to. So let's go ahead and test this app on a simulator, starting with Android. Here to the top of Visual Studio, you're going to find a few options. And doing this on Windows is going to vary slightly. We're going to take a look at that in one of the lectures in this section. But mainly you can select what project we're going to be testing. Let's select Android. How are we going to be testing this on Android? Actually, in here I also see iPhone and iPhone simulator options, which make no sense at all. But let's go ahead and select Debug. And you are very likely going to see an option in here listed, at least one option in here listed of virtual devices, Android virtual devices that you can use to test your application. If you don't, which I find very unlikely, you will see this Manage Android Devices option. Again, on Windows, is going to be slightly different. We'll take a look at that. And in this page, you will be able to create new devices. Now in here, you will have to select maybe what device is going to be the base of these virtual devices that you're creating. As you can see, you can select from many different templates. Let's call them that. Processors, the operating system that you will use and many different options in here regarding 
RAM, regarding GPU, regarding cameras, the battery, etc. Just go ahead and create one. And once it is created, it should appear in the listing here. So I'm going to go ahead and select any of the options that I have and click on run. Now, when we made the installation, and by the way, I do have an error because I changed the name of my clicked event handler on C Sharp, but I didn't on SAML. So let me go ahead and do so. So I was running this application and telling you how when we installed this application, we searched for, I'm sorry, Visual Studio, when we installed everything, we searched for Haxam or the hardware accelerated options for Android emulation. And if you were able to install that, the Android emulator is going to launch quite quickly. So here I see the Android emulator that is already up and running after a very few seconds. Now we should wait for the application to be installed. We see Visual Studio working on it. And after a few seconds, we should see the application launching. With the application up and running, we see this navigation bar that I was talking about, this title bar that the navigation page adds. And in here we see that new toolbar item that we have added from uh, to the contacts page. And if we click on it, the event handler is going to be executed, the one that we have up here, which precisely has the push async to the main page. And we saw how we get navigated over here. And here is an interesting thing. One, by the way, my emulator is very, very small, as you can see. This is usually not that big. And as you can see, the save button is barely visible there. But the important thing in here is that the navigation page also added this back button. Now on Android, we always have the software or the hardware button in there. But in iOS, this is actually crucial. And we are going to see that back button as well. So we can see how we have this UI ready. We see all of the entries, the button, the new contact button, and we see the navigation happening very easily. In the next lecture, we're going to take a look at this same thing on iOS. And you will notice how this same code has created the very same result on iOS as well, of course, adapted to native controls. Now that we have tested on Android, it's time for us to test on iOS. Now testing on iOS when you are on Mac is going to be as straightforward as testing on Android. All we have to do is change the project that we're going to be running to the iOS project. Also select debug and select one of the many simulators that get installed when you install Xcode. I am going to be selecting the iPhone 10 simulator. Of course, the newer the simulator, the more resources it's going to use. If you are trying to save resources on your computer, maybe you don't have that much RAM, you could select the iPhone 5S, which is the oldest of these simulators. It should use the least resources. I can simply go ahead and select iPhone 10 and hit run. Now on Windows, it is going to be slightly more complicated. We're going to talk about it extensively in the next lecture. So if you're on Windows, you will have to jump over to the next lecture and learn how to test an iOS. And meanwhile, here it is the simulator launching. And after a few seconds, it is quite quickly as well. We see the application up and running in here. And we also see this new button. And if we click on it, we get navigated over here where we see all of the same text fields. In the case of iOS, they are called text fields. Well, they are just entries on Xamarin. We see the button and on iOS, very important. We could not do this application without it, the back button. As you can see, it is exactly the same functionality, the same navigation, except that Xamarin Forms is built to precisely use entirely native controls, as we have already seen by the way in the designer. 
The difference by running this application already in the simulator is that we can see the title bar, for instance, and test the actual functionality, something that we cannot do with the designer alone. Now, it is very important for you to notice how native this looks because eventually it is entirely native. I make a big emphasis on this because people sometimes confuse or misinterpret the functionality from Xamarin, especially with Xamarin forms, because we are defining the UI with SAML, but this doesn't at all mean that this doesn't end up as an entirely native application with entirely native controls. So now that we have taken a look at the application, how it looks, of course, in the next lecture, we're going to take a look at how to run this on Windows. But in the next section, we're going to start to add the actual functionality. Now that we have the navigation and the UI, we're going to start to add functionality for us to save new contacts on a local database. Starting in the next lecture, or in the first lecture of the next section, after we talk about how to test on Windows, we're going to learn how to add new packages to our project. So we don't have to code the entire functionality, we can import functionality that other developers have created. To be able to test your iOS applications on Windows, you will have to do a bit more than on Mac and for the case of Android. For the case of Android, just like on Mac, you can just make sure that the Android project is selected from this dropdown, that you have selected debug, and select one of the emulators. At least you should have one by default in here. But for iOS, you will have to do a bit more things. Like I mentioned in the previous lecture, what you actually need is for your Visual Studio on your Windows computer to connect to a Mac host. So that is why you need a Mac computer. I briefly mentioned that you could use MacInCloud.com if you do not have access to any Mac computer whatsoever. That way you can just test your iOS applications. So let's go ahead and test this out. I will have to navigate over to Tools first and foremost, go to Options, and in here find the Xamarin Options and the iOS settings. Notice that in here you have the ability to pair to a Mac computer. So I will go ahead and pair to my Mac computer. By the way, by default, your Mac computer is not ready for you to do this. So you will have to do these three steps. And in fact, since I'm on my computer right here, I can search for a remote login here on the sharing folder. And once I am here, let me actually take a look at the second step which is for you to go over to remote login, which I have right here and enable it. So I can see that it is on. And right now I'm allowing this to all users. You could also restrict who can remote login and just hit on next. And notice that here I find my Mac computer. I can hit on connect and I can write the username and password that I use to log in to my Mac computer. And my Visual Studio is going to go ahead and make a connection to my Mac computer host, which by the way, can only happen because my Mac computer already installed all of my Xamarin tools. So because my Mac computer already installed Visual Studio in the Mac computer, this connection can happen. If you haven't installed Visual Studio on the Mac that you want to connect to, you have to do that first. But notice that now that I am connected, I can just close this. Notice that back here in the options, I see a colorful icon in here, which means that we are connected. And now what I can do is select iOS. And because I am connected, I will now be able to find all of these simulators. And in fact, I could also now from Windows take a look at the designer for iOS as well, because now my Windows computer or Visual Studio on Windows is connected to the Mac. And also, by the way, back in the tools, options, iOS settings, you could remote the simulator to Windows, 
which I'm going to leave selected for you to notice a, a bit of a difference in here. So I am going to run this. In this case, I'm going to be using the iPhone 8 simulator, but I want you to notice a small difference in here. And by the way, if you do not select that option to remote the simulator to Windows, the simulator would open on the Mac computer, just as if we were running it from Visual Studio on Mac. But because I selected these to be remoted to Windows, after a few seconds, we should see the simulator start on my Windows computer. The simulator is still fully running on the Mac. We absolutely need the Mac for this. This is not actually running on Windows, but Visual Studio has this tool, notice, that will allow the simulator to be displayed here on Windows. Some very interesting wizardry is going on in here because the simulator now opens in here. And you can see that it is quite different to the one that we see. I mean, it's exactly the same. It just looks a bit different. But eventually you will see the same iOS simulator pop up in here or start right here. We see the application launching. And after the application launches, we see the exact same interface. Of course, in here I selected the iPhone 8. In the previous lectures, I used the iPhone 10 simulator, but you can see how we see the new button. We see the same UI that we just saw, and we see the same back button that is absolutely necessary on iOS. So there you have it. This is how, or the steps that you have to perform to be able to test for iOS directly from a Windows computer. We already have the main functionality for navigation and the UI for what is going to be displayed to the user. We already tested how we see that new toolbar item at the top right of our application, so both Android and iOS. And we see the main page, of course, listing all of these entries that we're going to need along with the save button. During this section, we're going to add the functionality to save new contacts on a local database. Particularly, we're going to be working with SQLite. This is going to be a very light form of a database, and we're going to be able to work with it entirely locally, which means one, that the data is only going to exist inside of the phone where this application is running, and two, that it is going to be quite light to work with it. So to be able to do so, we do not have to code the entire functionality. There have been developers that have created some packages for us to work with SQLite and made it very easy for us to start working with it. All we have to do is make sure that we import the packages that those developers have made available to the public into our projects. So let's learn how to do so in this lecture. On Windows, all you have to do is right click on the solution and select Manage NuJ Packages for Solution and do something very similar to what we are about to do. On Visual Studio for Mac, unfortunately, you have to do this project by project. Again, on Visual Studio on Windows, you can do it for the entire solution in one single step. On Mac, you will have to do it once for every project that you have. So on Mac then, we're going to be able to find the dependencies and find the new chef folder. Here in the new chef folder, you will have to right click and select add packages. And you will be navigated to this. On Windows, you should now see something very similar after right clicking and selecting Manage NuJ Packages for Solution. Make sure, by the way, on Windows that you are on the Search or the Explore tab, not on the Installed or Updates tab. And in here, we're going to search for a particular package that will allow us to use SQLite. This is going to be the SQLite-net-pcl package. And we're going to find someone very important. There are many results in here. Find the one that is called exactly that, SQLite-net-pcl. The one that in fact has a ton of downloads, the one with the most downloads, over a million now. 
the one by a Frank A. Kruger. And the one that has this cute icon in here. Very important that you select this one. There is another one that is similar, but it has very few downloads and it has an ECP name at the end. Do not select this one. Select the latest version available and hit an add package. Windows is going to be quite similar. You're going to go ahead and install it. Maybe some pop-ups are going to appear for you to accept the license terms, something like that. Here, it is already successfully added. We can see that Visual Studio is letting us know. On Windows, again, you're probably good to go. On Mac, we will have to repeat this same step on Android as well. From the Packages folder, select Add Packages. And now you should see SQLite listed at the top because we have just used it. So select it and select Add Package. And again, repeat this on iOS. In the Packages folder, select Add Packages and add the SQLite package. This is how you add these packages to your project. Now, your projects are ready to start using the functionality that Frank Kruger added to this package. As you will be able to see, the functionality or the code has made it super easy for us to start working with SQLite. So, starting in the next lecture, we're going to make some configurations on Android and on iOS so we know where is this database going to be stored. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the next lecture. For now, you just have to keep in mind that Android and iOS have different directories. The operating systems work slightly different. So we will have to kind of like work twice for once in summary forms. Maybe the only time that you will have to code slightly different functionality for each platform. But that is the reason because Android and iOS work so differently with files that we will have to do something slightly different. So starting in the next lecture, let's do so on Android. So we're going to be working with SQLite. And in a previous lecture, we already went ahead and installed the packages in all of our projects. On Windows, we had to do it from the solution just once. On Mac, we had to do it once per platform, but our project should be already good to go. Now, I briefly mentioned in the previous lecture that because iOS and Android work slightly different with their files and their directories are different, we will have to code a different functionality or a different setup in each platform. Again, on summary, especially on summary forms, you're aiming for almost 100% code reuse. There are going to be some scenarios where there has to be a slight difference, as is the case that we're working with right now. Because we're going to be working with a SQLite file for the database that has to be stored on the phone and Android and iOS are going to be slightly different, we do have to make that distinction. Now, actually, Samurai has being very good at minimizing the changes that are required. And if Apple didn't have a small restriction that I will talk about in the next lecture, this could actually be identical. But I do want to mention that you could always add specific functionality for each platform. So let me go ahead and close these files that we have in the shared project that we're not going to be using right now. Navigate over to the Android project and find the main activity. If you have ever worked with Android development with Java, or just native Android development in general, you should know that we work with activities on Android. Activities have their own UI. And this is exactly the same layout of a traditional native Android project because it actually is only using C Sharp in this case. And that is why we see a main activity. We do see some changes. For example, this is inheriting from a forms app compat activity that Samarin created. But overall, this is going to be quite the same thing. Except, of course, that we're not going to be defining the UI on XML because we're already de defining it 
through with the help of some forms with XAML and C sharp. So the thing is that here, notice that we are loading the application and we see here an app class that should be very familiar to you because we saw it over here in our contacts shared project. We see the app class right here and it is where we define the main page to be a navigation page. This is how the Android application is using our shared project, summary forms, to initialize the UI through the load application method and initializing it to a new app. Now, what we will have to do in here is leverage the fact that we can connect somehow to the main project or the app class in this case to pass to that project where, in the case of Android, is our SQLite database going to be located. So right before calling the load application, I want to define where is this file going to be located. And let me start by defining a string for the file name. Simply how my database is going to be called. And the file name is going to be contacts underscore db dot db tree. The extension is not that important. This could even be a txt or something. Let's just call this a db tree file already and store this on the file name. Now, now that we have the file name, we should get the folder path. Where is this file going to be stored? And here is where the difference with iOS is going to be important. On Android, there are really no restrictions in here, but I do want to get a specific folder path. So let's go ahead and search for the environment class. Now, as you can see, there is one environment class in android.os. This is not the environment class that we need. The environment class that we need is inside system. So system.environment, very important that we specify this then because there are two environment classes available. So we have to specify their namespaces. So system.environment is going to contain a get folder path method. And the get folder path method is going to require the name of the special folder for which we want to get the path. And the special folder, we can receive it or search for it by writing system.environment.special folder. And in this case, I'm going to be searching for the personal folder. This is a folder that already exists and that Samarin can map to a specific path inside of the Android ecosystem, the Android operating system. And so its path will already be inside of the folder path variable. The last thing that we have to get is the complete path, which is going to combine the folder path with the file name. Now it's not as easy as just combining them as you would combine any two strings. There is a small science going on with the paths that you have to establish. So for us to not complicate things, let's just use one very easy way there is a path class that we have access to. Now, not immediately, but notice that if I write or type on my keyboard on Mac, Alt Enter, I see options of how to resolve this error that I have here. Because immediately path is not recognized. Notice that it says that the name path does not exist in the current context. So all I have to do on Mac is type Alt Enter or on Windows, control dot and see that I can solve this by adding a using statement up here. And notice that using system.io has been added and now path is recognized. And path is going to have a combined method that is going to receive as many strings as we need. In this case, we can pass the folder path and the file name. And now complete path is going to have the entire path to the new file that we are creating in here. 
all there is left for us to do is pass this to the app. But of course, right now the app does not receive anything. If we navigate over to the app class that is inside of the shared project, we see that it receives nothing. But we can actually create a new override of this constructor and tell this constructor that it is going to be requesting the final path. This is going to do the exact same thing. It's going to call the initialize component, it's going to set the main page, but it is also going to receive a file path and it should assign it to a variable that we are going to be creating. So variables, by the way, should always be defined before the constructors, or it's not absolutely necessary, but it's a good practice. And what I'm going to do is define a public static string that is going to be the file path. It is going to be static because we should not need to instantiate the app class to be able to access it. And we're going to assign its value from the second override of the constructor to the file path that is being received through the argument. So eventually we will be able to access the file path from any other page, defining it here on the app class. And because the app class is the first thing to be created when we run the application, right here in the load application call, the file path will be established and we will be able to access it from the contacts page and from the main page. All there is left for us to do then is here when calling the new app constructor, use the constructor that we have just created and pass the complete path. Here we have established at least on Android so far, where is the file for the database going to be located and we have sent it already to the app. So Android is already good to go for us to start saving and reading from this database. Now in the next lecture, let's go ahead and do the same thing for iOS. So we have already defined where is our file for the database going to be located on Android. Let's now go ahead and do the same thing for iOS. Now this is actually going to be quite identical. In fact, all I have to do is copy these three lines of code that I added to the main activity and paste them over on the app delegate that we have on iOS. Similar to what we just saw with the main activity here on the app delegate, we see that a load application method is being called and the app constructor is being called as well. And just like the main page on Android, the app delegate is going to be the first class to be instantiated with when the iOS app launches and the finish launching method is the one that does that as well. So we know that the load application is being used to load the iOS application from the summary forms functionality that we're coding over in the shared project. So let's just go ahead and paste the functionality or the setup of the file name in here. Of course, we will have to also add the using a directive to system.io to use the path class. And in this case, we don't need to establish system.environment because in the case of iOS, there is only one environment class available. Now, I did mention that Apple has a small restriction as to where these files can be located. It turns out that these files have to be in a specific location. We cannot have them here inside of the personal folder. We have to have them in a folder that is at the same level of personal, which means that we would have to get out of personal. So let's say that personal is in a folder name example. So we have a folder name example and inside of the example folder, we have the personal folder. We have to go back to the example folder and from the example folder, enter the library folder. So to do that, what we're going to do is combine uh, a couple of paths in here. So from the path, I am also going to call the combine method. And the combine method is first going to receive the path to the personal folder. And by the way, I removed 
the environment in here dot get folder path there we go and so we're going to combine the path to the personal folder with two dots which if you have ever used command or the command prompt you know this is how you get out of a folder and after we get out of a folder back to the other directory I am going to enter the library folder so this is basically how we can get out of the personal folder to the example folder and enter the library folder so this is everything that we had to change here on iOS the name for the file is going to remain the same we have to still combine the folder path with the file name and eventually send this to the app constructor which we already defined in the previous lecture now the setup for iOS is complete as well starting in the next lecture we can go ahead and start inserting new elements in SQLite of course we're going to be doing that from the main page where we have this form where we can create a new contact of course before in the next lecture we have to do some other things let's just for now know that SQLite is pretty much ready we have already added the packages and we are already establishing for both iOS and Android where the database is going to be located so our SQLite functionality is set up we have added the packages that are required to all of our projects and we have now from both Android and iOS set where in each of those platforms is the database file eventually going to be located now we should be ready to start saving new elements but of course before doing that we have to somehow define the tables and well just one table in this case but we should also define the columns for that table now like I said the functionality that the packages come with is going to set up that very easily but we do have to set how is this going to be translated into C sharp basically we need to define a C sharp class that will eventually be used by the package that we imported to create a table and create its columns and this is actually going to be the class that we use to create objects from it that eventually are going to be entries in the table so let's go ahead and do that in this lecture and we're going to be basing that class in the entries that we have here so each of the entries that we have in the main page is going to be eventually one of the columns so this is going to be pretty much the model of our contact so let me just right click on the contacts project the one that is shared and first add a new folder let me just have some structure here with my folders and call this classes and inside of the classes folder I am going to add a new file and I am going to search for the empty class template this is going to be this is of course going to be a C sharp class on Windows by the way you have the ability to add a class right away by right clicking on the folder selecting add and there you have a class option either way we are going to be calling this contact and the new contact class is going to be quickly created all we have to do here on the contact class is define its properties again one property for each of the entries that we're going to have so for example we're going to have a name property and by the way to quickly create properties all we have to do is write prop notice that you see a template for a short property being listed in here simply type tab twice and you will have this property very quickly created we first need to set the type of the property this is going to be string and its name which is going to be name and we're going to do the same thing for the last name for the email for the phone number and for the address so five elements we are going to be needing one for each of them and the fact that we're going to be using databases requires an ID so we need to establish an ID 
In the case of SQLite, that ID will have to be an integer. So I'm going to be defining an int element that is going to be ID. This is how we're going to be defining the model of the contact. Basically, it's going to require one property for each of the elements that we need for the contact. And of course, eventually each of these are going to be translated into a column inside of the contact table. It is also going to be requiring the ID for it to be the primary key, which by the way, we should establish with a SQLite attribute. So SQLite attributes are going to help the SQLite package understand how are these going to be created when we define the table or where when the package creates the table. For example, if we define the ID as the primary key, which by the way requires us to add a using directive to the SQLite namespace, the table when it is created will know that the ID has to always be unique. And in fact, we can set this to auto increment itself. So maybe the first time we insert something, it is going to be a zero and the next time it is going to be one and so on and so forth. And there are many attributes that you could use, for example, for the phone number, you could use something like the max length and in parentheses establish the value. Let's say that for a phone number, the max length is going to be 10. And you know, there are many other attributes that you could use. Let's, for example, you could in, in case you want the table to be named different than the name of the class, you could use an attribute for the class, the entire class as well, which would be the table attribute and in parentheses, you could establish the name. So in case you wanted the name of the table to be different than the name of the class, you would establish it here and the name of the class would be ignored. The name that you establish here is the one that to be used. And the same with properties is if you wanted it to not be last name, you would use the column attributes and inside of the double quotes set the actual name that you want inside of the table for the column instead of the name of the property. I am not going to be focusing a lot on all of the attributes that you can set. These are the ones that we're going to need. Nothing else is really necessary. But now we actually have the model how the table is going to look like. So that means that we are good to go to start creating new contact objects from that class with the help of whatever is written inside of these entries and insert them into the database. Now that we have set up everything that we really need, including the content class, it is time for us to actually start using the SQLite database. So far, we haven't done anything with it more than adding the packages that we're going to be adding. So during this lecture, we're going to be coding some functionality inside of the save button clicked event handler. So in there, we are saving a new contact inside of a new table. So what is it that we have to do in here? Well, first of all, we're going to need to create the contact that we're going to be saving. Thankfully, we already have all of these entries where the user can write the name of the contact, the last name, the email, the phone number and the address. Unfortunately, up until now, we really don't have a way to read whatever is in these entries. And you may already know the answer to this one, but we have to do something very similar to what we did with the button. And that is to assign a name to these entries. So later on, we can actually access them through the main page. Remember that we saw that Xamarin automatically, when we set a name to an element in SAML, it creates the actual property inside of the main page class. Not in any of these two files that we have available, but in one that is actually hidden by default. So what I'm going to do is simply assign some names to these entries. The first one is going to be the name entry. And I do recommend that you come up with some naming convention that is going to make it easy for you to identify one entry from another. In my case, all I do is write what this entry is about, for example, last name, and that this is an entry indeed. 
similar to what we have with the button in here. The uh, save button name is very easy to assume that this is a button and that is used to save something. So this other is going to be the email entry. I will also have the phone entry and finally the address entry. And so now that my entries have names, so all I have to do is come back to the main page.saml.cs where I have this event handler for the click of the button and create a new contact. Now contact is a class that I have in a different namespace because I have it on a different folder. So I will need to add it using directive to that namespace, which is contacts.classes, different to the namespace where these main page is located on. And so I am going to be creating a new contact. Now I can use this notation in C sharp to be able to create this new contact immediately with some values. So I can assign the initial value for the name property, which in fact is going to be the text that is written inside of the name entry. Just like this, we can access that text whatever text the user has written in here. And so the name of this new contact will already have that text assigned, add creation. And we can do the same thing for the last name, the same thing for the email, the same thing, what's next, the phone number, and finally the address. Now, of course, I cannot do this for the ID. Remember that I also have an ID property inside of the contact, but that if you remember, is going to be set to auto increment thanks to this SQLite attribute. So I have the contact that needs to be inserted. Now, the next part is the actually important part, the one where we're going to be inserting this into the database. And this is going to be very straightforward, but I do want you to notice the notation that we're going to be using in here, the syntax. So what I'm going to do is use a uh, using a statement. This is going to be different from a using directive. And in fact, it's entirely different in, in its functionality. But instead of this using statement, I am going to be creating a new SQLite connection. Now the SQLite connection class is inside of the SQLite namespace. So I can either write SQLite.SQLite connection or add a using directive, which is different from a using statement again, to SQLite. So I don't need to write it down and I can just write SQLite connection. This is going to be the connection and it's going to be equal to a new SQLite connection. Now notice in here that the constructor for the SQLite connection requires a database path. And it so happens we already have that inside of the app class as a static property that we can access immediately. So just like this, we have initialized a new SQLite connection connecting to a specific file that we are receiving through a specific path that you remember we set to something different from Android and from iOS. And so no matter what project is running this, this is going to work because both from Android and iOS we are setting this value. Okay, so we have this using statement, different from a using directive, which simply tells this file that it should use a specific namespace to search for types or other things. The using statement, what it's going to do is make a specific element exist only inside of its context in this case, the connection. Now, what this means is that as soon as the using statement is executed and the execution leaves this block of code, the connection is going to be disposed. Now, we can only do this, use a using statement, with classes that implement the iDisposable interface, this interface right here because that interface makes the classes add a method that is called dispose. Notice that precisely the SQLite connection contains a dispose method. 
this dispose method is here because the connection, the CQLite connection class, implements the I disposable. And so this using statement is going to automatically call that dispose method for us. And what that is going to do is actually going to close the connection to this SQLite database. Now we could always close it by calling the close method, but I do greatly recommend that you use this syntax so you don't have to remember to close the connection every time because you can always have one connection to the database at a time. So if you weren't closing the connection in here, you wouldn't later be able to connect again and maybe read from the database. So that is why we're going to be using this notation. Now, the important thing in here, let's go ahead and insert into the database. Of course, to be able to insert into the database, we need a table. So let's first go ahead and create a table. Notice that the create table exists inside of the connection. And in fact, there are a couple of create table methods. The one that I want to use is the generic one, which is going to be requesting inside of these angle brackets what table we're going to be creating. And that is going to be the contact table. And we don't need to pass anything to the method. And that's it. Just like this, I told you it was going to be easy. Just like this, thanks to that package that we imported, we have created a table that is going to be called in the same way that this class is. And it's going to have one column for each of the properties of this class. Thanks precisely to that package that we imported. And so now that we have the table, we can make sure that we can insert into it. Now there is an insert method. Again, I told you this was going to be very easy. The same SQLite connection class con contains an insert method that will receive any kind of object. So we can pass the contact. And of course, this method is going to be smart enough to know that this object is of type contact, so it should be inserted to the contact table. Now, if there was no table that corresponds to this type, this would throw an exception. So it's very important that you create a table before inserting. Now, the insert method is actually going to return an integer with the amount of rows that were modified, or in this case, added. So let's take a look at the rows added variable that is going to be equal to con.insert. So I'm going to set a breakpoint in here to run this because so far we are not really reading from the database. So the only way to know if this was successful is to inspect the value of rows added. If we insert a new contact after clicking the save button, and if it was successful, rows added should be one. If it is not one, if it is zero, we are going to have to take a look at what we are doing wrong. But I think everything is correctly, correctly set up now. Let's just run this on the simulator. I'm going to use the iOS simulator, of course. This is going to work in the exact same way for Android. Let me just test on iOS in this case and take a look at the rows added. If the rows added is one, again, that would mean that we have inserted successfully one item inside of the database. And so in the next lecture, we will be able to read. For now, let's just go ahead and navigate to the new contact page, set a name. This is going to be me. So let's just write some things in here. I'm not going to be writing especially my email in here, nor my phone number, nor my address, just some text in here for testing. Click on save. We hit the breakpoint and we see that rows added is one. So that means that we have successfully saved one new contact that, by the way, has all of that information that I just written in those text fields, as you can see, or those entries in the case of Xamarin Forms, they are text fields on iOS. But as you can see, the ID is also set to one. This is going to auto increment, so the next one would be two. So there you have it. We have successfully inserted items into the table 
in the next lecture we're going to be reading them. So we are already inserting into a new contact table that we created inside of our SQLite database. The next thing that we have to do is read from the contacts page because of course eventually what we're going to do is every single time we are here on the contacts page display to the user all of their contacts. Now the best way or the best place to start to read in this database is when we navigate to this contacts page. So this would be of course the first time the app is opened because if you remember the contacts page is going to be the first page to where we navigate thanks to us setting that page as the root of the navigation page. So that's the first time when we open the application. But also, if we from the contacts page navigate to the main page and then navigate back, we want to read the database again in case we added new contacts from the main page. Which means that we have to figure out a way to know whenever we are navigating to the contacts page. And there is actually one very useful method coming directly from the content page. So the contacts page is inheriting a virtual method that we can override that is called on appearing. As its name suggests, on appearing is going to be executed every single time the application is displaying this page. So when this page is appearing to the user, it is in here where we want to read the table. Now, very similarly to what we did to insert, we're going to need a SQL-like connection. And it is very important that we use a using statement so we don't have to manually call the close method every time. So I create a new connection in here that is going to be connecting to the same file path or using the same file path that we already have on app. And through the connection, we will be able to read. Now, we already created the table from the main page. However, I want you to think about it. The first time we navigate here to the application, it is the contacts page, the one that is going to be displayed before the main page. And so the first time at least, the on appearing is going to be called way before we click the save button, where the contact table is being created. Which means the first time there is no table to be read. Which means that we should actually create the table in here. So we're going to be creating it in the same way. This is a contact table. And I need a using directive in here. And I'm just calling the create table here as well. Which means that I will now be able to read from it. So I will just get a variable called contact to be from con and call the table method. The table method is also going to tell me which table I want to read or ask me which table I want to read, I can tell it inside of these angle brackets. And just like this, notice the contacts is going to be a table query. Now what I can do is call the toList method. And for me to be able to use the toList method, I will explain about it in just a second. I will first need a using directive to system.link. And so system.link is going to provide me with a to list method. Now what this to list method is going to do is grab the query that I'm making to the table and turn it into a list. And so notice contacts is now a list of contacts. So very easy to read from the table. Our contacts variable is now going to contain all of the contacts that we have inside of the table. Now, before moving forward to the next section and start to display these contacts, I want you to know something. Yes, we are creating the table kind of like twice in here. One when we want to read from it and another one every single time we want to insert to it. Now, don't worry. 
if SQLite sees that we are trying to create a table that already exists, it is simply going to ignore the execution. And it's going to be very efficiently done. So this is not really having any impact in the efficiency of our application. It is a good practice to do the creation of the table. After all, if it already exists, it's not going to be created again or deleted or anything. And it's not really going to impact how our application works. So we are now reading from the table. Let's go ahead and test this out. I am going to add a breakpoint in here, which means that the first time this breakpoint is hit, if I don't add any more elements, any more contacts, this list of contacts should have one contact inside. So the time of the truth, let's go ahead and test this out. And if everything goes correctly, very quickly, right at the beginning of the application, we should hit the breakpoint, inspect the contacts variable and see that indeed, there is one element in here of type contact. And if we expand it, we see the exact same text that I just inserted in the previous lecture. And of course, if I were to keep running this and create a new one, let's create a test one in here. Let's just write test in everything. After all, I'm not going to be making any evaluation to see if this is actually an email or not. So let's just save this. Of course, I hit the breakpoint. I see that this is correctly saved. So let's just remove that breakpoint now. Now notice that as soon as I head back, the unappearing is executed again. And now the contacts variable has two contacts. The new one that I have just inserted, notice has an ID of two. So the auto increment works and it is right here inside of this list, which means that we are also successfully reading from the table which means that we are ready to start displaying the elements inside of this interface. We don't have that functionality yet, so starting in the next lecture, we are going to be taking a look at list views and how list views are going to easily allow us to display lists like the one we have right here in the form of the contacts variable inside of the interface. So we're already both inserting and reading from a new contact table that we created inside of the SQLite database. What we have to do now is figure out a way to display this contacts list inside of the UI. So during this section, we're going to be inside of the contacts page, working with a list view. So, so far our content page inside of the contacts page only has a definition of one toolbar item, which is currently navigating us to the main page. However, what we're really needing here is some content so we can actually start listing the head list. This is actually going to be quite straightforward. And all I have to do is define some content in here. So like I previously said, we can have the toolbar items definition, but this is really not the content of the page. This is something that goes inside of the toolbar, the title bar that we see thanks to the navigation page. However, it is the content, the one that is actually going to contain whatever is going to be displayed inside of the page. In here is where we need to define the list view that we're going to be working with. Now, currently, I'm actually going to be defining it in just one line. Eventually, I do need to make some changes to this definition. Right now, let me just define it in one line. And notice that immediately you see a list of cells listed inside of the designer. And what we're going to do is having this list view, use it in a very similar way to the way we have been using other elements. We're going to be assigning a name to it. And this is going to be the context list view. And what we're going to do is set its item source. It is precisely the item source property of the list view, the one that, well, is going to set the list views source, 
what is the list view going to be using to display many elements. So let's go ahead and do that right after reading the contacts. So we have this contacts variable and all I have to do is access the contacts list view and set the item source to these contacts. Now this can necessarily happen because the contacts is already a list and the item source needs to be an enumerable. Notice that the type of the item source is an I enumerable. Now this is an interface, but it turns out that list actually in some way implements the I enumerable interface. So this is compatible. We can assign a list to an I enumerable, which is exactly what we're doing here. So basically right after reading the content table and um, making this query be transformed into a list with the help of link, we're going to be assigning this list of contacts to the list view. Now, I hope it was that easy, but let's go ahead and run this and take a look at what the list view is going to be displaying so far. Now, if you remember in the previous two lectures, I have already inserted two elements. I have not added any other element. I have deleted nothing, but still I see nothing in here. As you can see, even though the list view is here, it is quite empty. Now, I do want you to notice that if I click on the first cell, it is selected. So is the second cell and the third one is not. That would make you think that something is working here because maybe these two cells are already displaying whatever is in those contacts only they are not really displaying anything. But we see that two elements are here and only two. If I click somewhere else in the list view, nothing happens. Only for the first two cells. So something must be working in here. Now, what we are going to take a look at in the next lecture is exactly how are we going to change what is being displayed in here. Because currently, because we define the list view just like this, entirely empty, it has no idea how we want to display elements. And so while it is listing the two elements because we are setting the item source, it doesn't know how these items should be displayed. So in the next lecture, now that we see that our list view is very quickly working, at least somehow working by setting the item source, how are we going to be displaying actual text or something? inside of these cells. So we already learned that by setting the item source of our list view to some I enumerable, we are able to start listing elements inside of it. However, we have set the item source, but we haven't tell the list view how is it supposed to display the items. That is why the items appear entirely empty. To be able to tell the list view how it should display the items, we should create the item template. So the list view is going to contain an item template property that we need to set. Without it, the list view has no idea at all how do we want to display the items. So we need to define the template for its items like this. And inside the item template, we are going to need to define a data template. Now, I don't want to get too deep into what the data template and data binding and bindings are yet. For now, let's just say that the data template is how this item template is going to show data to the user. And now that we have these and data template, the next thing that we have to do in this case is set what type of cell we're going to be displaying. And what I want to do is just use a text cell, simply a text cell. Now in the text cell, we happen to have a text, the text property that is going to allow us to display something. Now, I again, don't want to get too deep into what we're doing here. For now, let's just go ahead and write binding. For now, let's just leave it like this. Now, this is what is happening by default if we don't change anything. 
if we don't add all of these that we just added, this is what all this view is doing by default. What we have to do is tell it that it doesn't have to bind to the entire object. So this is what, what's happening. When the list view gets the source in the form of a list of contacts, each contact is going to be inside of a text cell and more particularly inside of its text. So because the contact is not a string, this cannot be displayed. So all we have to do is actually write the name of one of the contact properties after the binding. So let's say that we want the text of the text cell to display the name. All we do is write binding space and name. And magically, if we run this on the simulator, now the text cell should know how to display the name because the name is a text. It is a string and you can see immediately how, okay, the text cell now knows how to use a string to display a string because of course, right? So this is it is for us to start displaying those items here and the emulator is hard to grab, by the way, but this is how you can start displaying the information on those contacts. Now, of course, we have a lot more information that we have and that we are not displaying, and you could always create your own custom cell instead of a text cell. That would be a view cell, by the way, but that is something that I cover in a different course. What you can do, however, is use the detail. The detail is another text or another label that can be displayed inside of the text cell. And what I can do is set a binding to a different property. Let's say that I want to bind the email. And to make this a little bit more fun, let's actually change the text color. And I, I don't know, let's just use one of the predefined one of course you can always define your own coloring here but now if we run this we should not only see the text but we should see the detail with the email and the text should be a different color as you can see in here now we see that small detail label below the name or in this case the text label bind it to whatever is in the email. And of course, just as we have access to the text color, we have access to the detail color. So if we wanted this to be blue or any color again, you can set whatever color you want, you can do so. So there you have it. This is pretty much everything that we needed to do with this application and inside of these curves. Of course, this is a very easy introduction to the curse. I do encourage you to take a look at the next lecture where I talk about what else you can learn with Xamarin because you pretty much can do anything with Xamarin. Thank you so much for watching this curse. I hope that you have learned the basics. I think I talked about why I wanted to create this curse in the first place. I really hope that this has been useful for at least one person out there. Again, congratulations for completing this course and I will see you in the next lecture, which is the last lecture of this course. So just a quick note on what this bonus section is about, or really just this bonus lecture. So I want you to really become an expert on summary development and on app development in general. Now, of course, this course was tailored for newbies for everyone that was just starting out on mobile app development. And I really, really hope that this has been useful to you. By the way, congratulations on, on completing this course. What I do want to tell you is that this is just the beginning of what you can do with Xamarin. While it is a great start and similar to the start that I told you about at the beginning of the course, it will allow you to just open a ton of possibilities into what kinds of app you can build. There are a lot more things that you should be aware of and that you can do with Xamarin that, that will make your application so much better. Which is why in the resources for this lecture there is a PDF that has a list of courses that I have published here on Udemy 
and that you can access for a great discount. So if you just want to continue building more complex Xamarin Forms applications, if you want to learn about that Xamarin native applications that I talked briefly about, if you want to learn to design applications, if you want to learn to take this SAML and C-sharp new knowledge that you have and translate it into a desktop application, or even if you want to add some machine learning functionality into your applications very easily, well, there are courses in that PDF that can help you and that you will have access to for a very small price, at least compared to the one that is listed by uh, default on Udemy. So I really do encourage you to take a look at those resources. Overall, I just thank you for letting me be your instructor in this course and I sincerely hope that it has been useful to you. I cannot wait to learn what you create with this knowledge that you now have. Congratulations again for finishing this course and I hope to see you again in some